We have another number of other members of our committee who are presenting today. The private sector committee, committee is about advancing the interests of the private sector of meteorology in Canada. We meet as a committee bi-monthly to talk about issues that are arising in our industry and looking at ways that we can further uh, grow our industry and create a strong private sector in Canada. So I'm looking forward to hearing what all of these companies have to say today as part of their presentations. Uh, I think I was scheduled to go first, but due to the technical problems, uh, I'll come in sometime later, uh, but I'll throw it back now to Laura and she can introduce the format for today. Perfect, thanks Scott. Uh, okay, so uh, we have nine uh, organizations that will be uh, speaking today. Um, the order is listed on the screen, uh, though, as Scott has mentioned, uh, Weather Logics will not go first anymore. So, DR, I'm going to throw it to you first. I'll just uh, pull up your slides unless you prefer to share your screen. Happy to do whichever. Yeah, if uh, you allow me to share my screen, I definitely okay. can do that. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can get that. Um, so presentations will be about 10 minutes each. Hopefully uh, our speakers can keep it to that time. Um, and so we should wrap up uh, before 2 p.m. today for sure, even with the technical difficulties. So I'm going to go ahead and now try to... Um, it's been so long since I've done this. You could you could do the slides if you want, if that's yeah. easy, uh, uh, Laura, because okay. there won't be any change. Okay, I'm just gonna stop share for a second, run ahead to your slides. There we go, okay, sharing screen again. Sure. Okay. And that's Hi, yeah. Uh, as Scott said, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, to have me among you today. We will be presenting uh, WSP ENI Canada Limited Digital uh, Environment. Can you go to the next slide? Uh, just a brief intro about myself. My name is Dia Hassan. I'm a senior scientist and a business development and a water system product owner. I do wear a lot of hats here at WSP. Uh, I'm a project manager, a technical uh, lead. Uh, I do a lot of R&D and at the same time I go after RFPs and respond to them as well uh, and take them to fruition. Uh, at uh, by uh, by education by by profession i'm a certified consultant meteorologist i spend all my life in the uh, in the field of uh, commercial services and weather uh, and uh, if i would give my phone to my kids they throw it back at me because there's nothing but weather and uh, it and technology in it uh, as well so i think i would leave it out there and uh, we'll go to the next slide if you don't mind uh, so WSP is, uh, 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 is a global uh, uh, engineering consulting company. It's actually could be right now standing as the largest uh, consulting engineering company in the world. Uh, it uh, has, uh, it employs more than 70,000 people and it has offices in more than 40 countries. Uh, with more than 500 uh, offices worldwide. Uh, our uh, headquarter is in Montreal, as in Canada. Uh, we have collectively over 60 years of experience and uh, our recent revenue is about $9 billion. Now within WSP, we have a lot of departments. It's mainly environmental engineering uh, consultation services. Uh, and one of its uh, arms or departments is the digital environment. And that's where we work and related to the weather. So we will talk about the digital environment. So next slide, please. So within the digital environment, uh, we have uh, multiple sub-departments. So we have uh, our weather operation team. So we employ more than uh, 20 professional meteorologists uh, around the clock year round 24-7-365. We have built on our uh, forecast engine, we uh, ingest multiple regional and global uh, weather model data. We ingest uh, observations, again, regional, uh, national or global data, satellite data, radar data as well. Uh, and uh, we have created a very nice uh, forecast engine for our 
uh, forecasters to be able to produce uh, the forecast on a large scale because we have a lot of clients offshore, onshore, uh, you know, uh, across Canada and in the States, and we're able to serve them with the niche product that we do provide for them uh, throughout our platform. Supported by our uh, weather uh, operation team is our uh, software development team. So we have collectively uh, several developers who work with us uh, back and front end. Uh, they, uh, uh, they work uh, uh, not around the clock, but uh, on a regular uh, operational uh, uh, kind of hours uh, to build uh, products to deliver the forecast to uh, build new products for our clients or solve their clients to deliver data to them as well in terms of forecast and observation because as I mentioned we do operate on a very large uh, scale um, and uh, we also have an IT desk service and that's 24 7 365 to support our ongoing operation for our clients uh, in addition to this we have a remote sensing team who employs a multi-spectrum uh, data set from satellites uh, with machine learning uh, to provide our clients with the uh, environmental solution or solution that they uh, seek. We also have uh, operation analysis team where uh, they do a simulation of uh, complex uh, networking of equipments and operation. If it happens through a mine, if there is a large operation that is happening, they do a, a large simulation to provide more insight and optimize uh, operation in that uh, uh, way. Uh, and also we have a, a small team, which uh, I kind of um, kind of relate to, and I relate to all of them. Uh, the team that is not mentioned here is with the deal with R&D. We do a lot of uh, uh, R&D work uh, when it comes into uh, existing infrastructure, machine learning, uh, and uh, artificial intelligence as well. So uh, this whole operation is to serve our clients. And if you go to the next slide, if you don't mind, Laura. Uh, so we operate on a very large scale because we have clients in multiple sectors. We have clients onshore, we have clients offshore. And uh, within the uh, onshore, uh, we have um, governments, we have municipal, we have uh, energy companies. So we deal with multiple sectors. We have transportation, we have insurance, we have asset management, uh, we have oil and gas, uh, we have uh, power, we have clean energy, uh, and uh, multi-million dollar operations that happens on a daily uh, basis depends on our uh, forecasts and the services that we do provide for our clients. Uh, the services that we do provide, some of it is uh, niche products that you cannot find freely uh, on the web. Uh, and we do adhere and tailor that uh, service to the need of the client in the location and the sensitivity as well. We issue alerts, we issue warnings for our clients, just like uh, some government national weather service or uh, uh, Environment Canada. Uh, do. Uh, we have a uh, toll-free number for our uh, clients to reach out. We, they can chat with us, they can email us, uh, and we also have project management system in the company where every client has a project manager. Uh, it's a contact point to run the project, not just on a cost basis and budget uh, basis, but also to adhere to the needs uh, of the clients on an ongoing uh, operation uh, as well. Uh, Laura, we could go to the next slide if you don't mind. In addition to all this, we have a team who deals with climate resiliency. So basically they do risk mapping, they do climate resiliency studies, basically they find any hotspots within uh, certain communities that are more uh, susceptible to the climate change. They do more in-depth literature study, and then they do the climate lens assessment. Basically they sit with the, the client or the decision makers and make them understand the climate change uh, impact and the risk associated with it as well, and see if they could guide them, help them into reducing their uh, carbon footprint as well. And then the climate change vulnerability risk assessment is that's where the risk get uh, uh, the risk assessment gets uh, employed in terms of hazard assessment impact and risk assessment uh, itself. And I think I'm on time. Uh, maybe spare a few seconds. Uh, next slide. If there are any questions, we'll be more than welcome uh, to take all these questions. We always look for talent to join us uh, on multiple levels. So if there are any people out there who are um, looking to join uh, uh, some uh, uh, 
bigger companies and, and, and do some nice uh, science work, we always welcome that. And you could contact me. I think the next slide has uh, my contact, Laura, if anyone would like to reach out to me. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks so much, DR. We actually do have some time, so you, you flew through that. So uh, if anybody does have a question right now, uh, we could take that. Um, I'll give it 10 seconds. Um, if not, David, I'm going to ask you to be ready to turn your camera on if you wanted to, because uh, ATS will be next. Okay, we've got one. Yeah. I'll just unmute Neil. Yeah, so uh, thanks for the, actually, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks for that presentation. I'm just curious, um, what role has uh, collaboration with academia played in, in some of your work? Can you give some examples or some areas where you're looking for increased collaboration potentially? Yeah, definitely. We always uh, work with uh, academia in, in, two, uh, in, in two fronts. The, one of the fronts is, uh, uh, to uh, acquire, uh, you know, uh, new talents through co-op uh, programs that are out there to work with us, and that's mainly within the development. Uh, but also, uh, we we try to work with uh, academia to solve certain clients. So when we get a project that we need some R and D to it, uh, and some examples we have in Newfoundland, uh, uh, we did some uh, uh, work uh, with the university out there to uh, to do some uh, studies about fog and fog assessments and not just in Newfoundland, but also uh, at York University as well. Uh, so the, the, the collaboration will be uh, uh, project based. If there is a project that would need some collaboration and work, uh, we always do this. But on my uh, on my personal side, I always seek uh, collaboration with, uh, with academia. Uh, to uh, to do some research and work uh, that is uh, tangible or relevant uh, to the weather and the uh, client operation as well. So if there's anything in mind, please don't hesitate to contact me. I think there are a few questions. Yeah, the... well, let's, uh, so Armel has one question in the chat. Um, so that'll be the last one. And then I'll say anybody else, if you have questions, I'd say email DR. So um, for DR, the, que the governments that get your weather services, are they in countries that do not have a national weather agency or are the governments you alluded to at a local scale, not federal governments? Uh, so we do provide uh, for government agencies, they do have like here in Canada, most of our clients exist in Canada and then second within the within the states. And we know that there is Environment Canada National Weather Service. Uh, these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, could be cities, municipalities or ministries federal ministries or uh, provincial ministries, uh, not federal, but provincial uh, entities that we do provide these services to. Uh, the service is niched. You cannot find it through, like whatever we provide is, you cannot find it through Environment Canada on its own. That's why the, the service we provide is coming through us and, and they do come to us to provide, to get that information. Perfect. Thank you so much, DR. Uh, all right, so we have ATS services up next. So David, I see you've turned on your camera. Perfect. Um, and I've got your slides here if you if that's fine with you. That's perfect, Laura. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone for this opportunity to give a brief overview of ATS. Uh, ATS, uh, we're a Canadian business and have been in providing weather services for close to 25 years now across Canada. Our head office is uh, is based in Ottawa. Uh, what does uh, ATS do? Uh, we provide weather reporting services in support of flight operations and general public safety. Uh, we also provide as a distributor of instrumentation, meteorological instrumentation, uh, and uh, and training services uh, is under our umbrella. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, head office based out of Canada, but we operate at about uh, 60 locations across Canada. Most or many uh, of our locations are remote and located north of 60, uh, and we comprise about 185 uh, positions uh, from coast to coast to coast. Um, our workforce tends to be a cross-section of the communities where we operate, uh, and being primarily remote and northern, uh, we do have a large Indigenous representation amongst, uh, amongst our workforce. Uh, Laura, if you could flip the slide, please. So what are areas where ATS works? Well, as I mentioned, uh, north of 60, we provide the aviation weather reporting and the air to ground communication services at all of the community aerodromes in the Northwest Territory and the Nunavut Territory. 
Uh, that's information that's a direct benefit to the air operators, NAV Canada, Environment Canada. South of 60, uh, we provide the aviation weather reporting at uh, uh, many of the larger airports across Canada, including Vancouver International, Pearson, Ottawa, Dorval, Winnipeg, Halifax, as well as uh, uh, smaller uh, sites such as Chetwind or Massets out in British Columbia as a, as a sampling. For Environment Canada, uh, we provide upper air observing services where the aerological observer on a twice daily basis will release a radial sonde up into the atmosphere and obtain that vertical profile that then gets fed into uh, forecasting models. Um, in a different branch of ATS, we provide instrumentation sales. So we do not manufacture instrumentation. Uh, we act as the distributor for a range of uh, European manufacturers and our clientele is typically a researcher in an academic environment or a user within a national weather service. Uh, with the instrumentation that uh, we do provide is mostly orientated towards that uh, research or academic uh, uh, usage. And uh, as such, we don't carry inventory. It's typically uh, ordered to the customer's uh, specs uh, on a as and when needed kind of basis. Uh, on the training side of the house, uh, ATS provides the weather observing training uh, for all weather observers in Canada, whether they're employed with ourselves or with a different organization, including even Environment Canada. When they first hire their electronics technicians, uh, we provide them with uh, basic weather observing training uh, as part of their uh, their onboarding for Environment Canada. We conduct that training out of the what used to be the NAV Centre in Cornwall, Ontario. Uh, training is still in Cornwall, but the facility has recently changed hands. Um, and the Northern employees, of course, uh, in our world, they receive their initial job training at Aurora College. So two different training streams uh, uh, to the same, uh, same training standard. Um, that was a very brief and quick overview. Uh, Laura, if you flip the slide. Happy to follow up with any inquiries, either to our operations address or our sales address. And while we're here in this meeting, happy to uh, expand on this quick overview. Perfect. Thanks so much. If there's any questions for David, uh, feel free to raise your hand uh, or put it in the chat. Let's give it a few seconds to see if anyone has anything. Oh, we've got a hand up. Uh, Armel, go ahead. Hi, Laura, can you hear me? Yes, okay, great. Uh, David, awesome. Thank you for that presentation. Obviously, lots of linkages to Environment Climate Change Canada. My question is around um, emergencies when they occur and there's a need for airports to remain open for various uh, you know, search and rescue and other uh, needs. I'm thinking of Tofino just a couple of years ago when the Highway 4 was closed due to rock slides and I wondered at the time how your contracting works with um, observers in particular in order to keep an airport that isn't typically open overnight, open overnight during an emergency and whether or not that can be triggered in a very short scale time period. Yeah, for sure. Um, certainly those sites that don't operate 24 seven, so part-time sites, do have established published hours of service for which uh, the observers are responsible for fulfilling the hours of, of operation. Outside of the published hours of operation, services are provided on a call-out basis. Uh, and uh, it's an important note, and this is uh, used to Fino as an example, but I'll expand and use a more common scenario we encounter is in the north with uh, after-hours call-outs and the availability of, of staff. Uh, it is important to note that the observers are not on standby. So outside of published hours of service, um, the uh, decision to provide the service or respond to a call out uh, rests with the observer and a fit for duty aspect uh, to, get, to provide the services. As far as the organization that's requesting the call out uh, on the the mechanics uh, of operating that or the finances of operating that, it's a, it's a user pay system. Uh, if an air operator requests an out, out of hours call out, uh, then the air carrier agrees to pay the call out charge for having those services provided. 
Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I remember speaking with Emergency Management BC at the time, now Emergency Management and Climate Readiness, and there not being a, a standard operating procedure in order to uh, find out um, exactly how to turn that on and find out if there is the, the, the capacity from, well, to pay for it and to uh, do those observations. So it, I think um, it would be good to connect a few people uh, in the dots and uh, maybe across the country, in fact. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, uh, question from Jim. Oh, Jim, maybe put your hand down. Is that yeah. all on your... okay. I'm good. Thanks, Laura. And thanks, David. Nice to see you. It's been a while. I think it's Halifax in 2018 since I saw you in person. Yeah, the time um, flies, doesn't it, Jim? I know. Anyways, I was curious. Um, I, there was an article written in Science Magazine um, about monitoring in the North recently, and I was curious on uh, the percentage of the employees uh, on the various sites that are in, of Indigenous that that are of, of uh, indigenous uh, descent? Uh, good question. In in the Nunavut territory, about 90 to 95% of our Nunavut employees are Inuit, indigenous. In the Northwest Territories, we have more of a, a more of a cross section. Uh, approximately two thirds of our employees in the Northwest Territories uh, would identify as Dene, Métis, Inuit, so uh, a, a range of Indigenous representation in the in the NWT, and then in uh, in Southern Canada, uh, our employees are a cross section of the larger cities that uh, uh, where we have a presence, but certainly very much so in the uh, in the Arctic communities uh, uh, on the Nunavut side, you know, very strong, very high uh, Inuit workforce, and uh, and on the NWT. Uh, uh, similar, uh, a little more diverse, uh, but uh, still very much uh, an indig indigenous workforce. Awesome. So it's you, it's fair to say it's the the employees are representative of the population in the north. Absolutely, and uh, you know our, our goal or our desire is always to staff from within a community, keep the employment within the community, benefit the community through the. Uh, uh, through the participation in in the workforce and in the uh, observing programs. Great. Thanks a lot, David. Thanks, Jim and David. Uh, okay, one last question from Chris uh, for David. So could you please elaborate on your work relationship with NAVCAN and Environment Canada? Yeah, certainly. Uh, NAV Canada is the air navigation system provider uh, in Canada now has uh, the responsibility for the weather reporting, uh, the METAR and the special programs uh, at, at airports. Uh, some of that NAV Canada does in-house, and a large portion of that they contract out, which is the niche that ATS fills. And, and on the other side, uh, for Environment Canada, um, we directly feed into Environment Canada systems with the aerological observing uh, sites and programs that we, we provide with Environment Canada, but stepping back a step, the observing programs that we do under the NAV Canada umbrella, those observations feed into the national weather circuits and are used as input for the, uh, the baseline of the actual conditions from which Environment Canada produces the TAF for, uh, for airport usage and general uh, warning and forecasting services beyond just the aviation sector. Perfect. Thank you, David. All right. If anybody has any further questions uh, for David, uh, please email him at those listed on the screen. Uh, there's also on the final slide today, there will be uh, contact information. So if you didn't manage to get that. Okay. Uh, next, I'd like to invite uh, Adam Skinner uh, to present. I believe you'll be sharing your screen. Um, so you, am I correct in saying that you have to request that? Yeah. From so, um, I'll be so through my webcam. I'll be presenting everything. So I don't know if you can maybe pin my webcam to full screen. Is that is that possible? I, I think you should be able to. Go. If you click the ellipses ellipses uh, on me, you should be able to. Yeah. Okay. Make me full screen. Spotlight. Okay. Hey, that's perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'll hit start on my timer so I don't go over. <laughs> my name's Adam Skinner. I'm the founder and director of Instant Weather. Um, we have uh, actually been around for ten years. Yesterday is our ten year anniversary. And we have uh, a big social media presence, more than 1.2 million community members across Canada and the US. And uh, our, our entire goal is to raise awareness about tornadoes and severe weather. So 
Um, what I'd like to do today, as opposed to just chatting about the, the company, I kind of want to highlight uh, two really cool projects that we're working on. Uh, one is called Instant Weather Pro, and the other is called the 3D Weatherverse. So first and foremost, I'm going to talk about uh, Instant Weather Pro. So let me just jump into uh, to this here quick. So uh, Instant Weather Pro, uh, once we partnered with the Northern Tornadoes Project, uh, Dr. David Sills asked us to uh, come up with a pro radar suite that could, uh, that could suit their needs better and, and the needs of Canadians better as well. So uh, we developed uh, IW Pro. Um, and the cool thing is, is that it's a website. So um, no more downloading, installing software, uh, no updating each time there's a new feature. You just refresh it and you've got the latest, uh, the latest version of it too. Um, and it's uh, the first website that can animate uh, split screen, full resolution, raw Canadian radar data with up to 50 frames of animation, uh, no mapping tiles, no vector tiles. Uh, this is basically the first website that can do a true full resolution data. That was a very tricky thing too because when you have 200,000 polygons and you're trying to animate them uh, in a performant way doing that through a website is tricky uh, but a big benefit of this is that you can have uh, as many tabs open as you want so however powerful your computer is and however many monitors you can have uh, as opposed to being limited to the one executable file uh, for most pro radar suites you can just open up as many chrome tabs as you want and spread those across your monitors so that's pretty helpful stuff some cool things we're doing too is uh, it's the first time you've ever been able to swipe between two different products. So we do have the dual mode where you can see them side by side, um, but uh, I've always wanted the ability to uh, to go really, really deep and compare, uh, you know, pixel to pixel to see if a mesocyclone is underneath the hook echo or see if a TDS is underneath the, uh, the velocity couplet. Um, so that is one uh, really interesting feature we are working on uh, with this as well too. Remo removing noise is a big thing too because uh, the the quote unquote laser beams coming out of the uh, the new radars because of uh, radio frequency interference uh, is obviously not the greatest so we've been developing an algorithm to to get rid of that and I will demonstrate it in a sec as well uh, historical data we're going to have historical data uh, back to um, 2021 for Canada, all the way back to 1991 for some U.S. stations. Um, and we're going to be adding Canadian and U.S. alerts to it, also with some historical database to that as well. So uh, that's going to be pretty useful, I think, for looking back uh, and analyzing previous events. Um, being able to screenshot and record stuff as well, too. Um, and some other cool features, of course, lightning data. But uh, this is one that uh, Dave requested is for us to process all tilts. So instead of um, a lot of the other apps out there, they just have the bottom four tilts. Uh, it, when a storm goes over the radar station and you only have the bottom four tilts, that makes it pretty difficult to look up at, at the data. So uh, we are processing all 17 tilts and you will be able to tilt it right up to be able to see, let's say, you know, uh, damaging winds or rotation that happens to be right on top of the dome. Uh, that would be uh, pretty helpful stuff. But enough of this text, let me jump into uh, Instant Weather Pro here. Um, I brought up the, uh, the duratio from uh, May 21st, 2022. Uh, and uh, and just just give you an idea of uh, of what the the software looks like itself. Um, and uh, actually, you can see how noisy the radio frequency is right there. I'm going to remove it right now. So I'm going to jump into uh, Canadian noise reduction, turn it on. Let me just turn this off and on. And you can see um, uh, quite a reduction in the noise. So it's not perfect, uh, but it's certainly uh, it's certainly a big step forward in in noise reduction. Um, and it's it's quite helpful visually when you're dealing with with all of that noise. So we haven't applied it to velocity in this particular situation, but we will be doing that as well, too. So, um, yeah, so that's pretty, uh, pretty useful. Um, I do want to jump into another example here, which is um, the uh, this one hits home for me because I'm from Barrie. Uh, so July 2021, July 15th, 2021, I'll go to the uh, 230 frame here and I want to dive into Barrie, for example. So again, with the swiping tool, so this is the classic way to look at it. So you're looking at the meso over here, you're looking at the hook echo over here, you're trying to say, I think they're, I think they're associated. It looks pretty much like they are. Um, but if we switch over to split mode, so here's single and here's split, and then we're able to, uh, you know, really zoom in and, and swipe over and compare bin by bin. Uh, it, is this meso perfectly associated with that hook echo? Um, other cool features as well. We can tilt, which is kind of fun. Um, and from a personal perspective, I really like to eliminate friction. And what I mean by that is uh, with a lot of other apps, I feel I'm always diving into menus to change things. So with ours, um, as you can see down here, you can change the uh, you can change the animation speed with one click. You can change your uh, animation frames with one click. You can do the same thing for elevation tilts, same thing for products. 
Um, and it's all just kind of at your fingertips, which is quite useful. So yeah, so that is uh, is something we've been working really, really hard at. Um, also, too, accuracy of placement. Something we noticed um, with a lot of other software out there is that um, they take the, the point that uh, a radar beam is shooting, they take the individual data points and they build the bin out from that. So they actually build it out to the side where we feel that um, the data point should actually be in the center of the polygon. And I'll show you an example of that. So if I bring our radar placement down to zero, you can see the shift in it. But if we bring it up to 11, which is a little bit of a spinal tap reference here, um, you can see that uh, it's it's actually shifting it and making sure that it's as accurate as possible. And we verified this and it's and it's pinpoint. So uh, something something pretty interesting that we're we're working on. So it's been very, very exciting. Uh, a huge thank you to uh, to Dave and everybody at the NTP and the NHP for their support and their uh, and their feedback on it. Um, and we're aiming for the end of May, maybe early June, but probably the end of May uh, to launch the beta test for it. So, uh, so that's pretty exciting. Looks like I've got uh, looks like I've got a, f a few minutes left. Um, so, actually, what I'm going to do uh, is kind of. Uh, uh, Turn to uh, the 3D Weatherverse. So um, this is something we've also been working on and developing over the past few years uh, with a, an incredible company out of Australia. Um, and I do have a video for that. So I'm going to put this on here. Um, and uh, it tells a little bit more of our backstory as well, too. In 2013, I almost died when an EF1 tornado threw a 7,500 square foot roof at my car. I was so grateful to be alive that I set out to raise awareness about tornadoes and severe weather. We now have more than 1 million passionate community members across Canada and the US, and we've launched multiple products from the first ever 3D radar app to our free app, Instant Weather. After seeing what Ryan Brooks was able to create with paint clouds and the incredible power of Unreal Engine 5, I'm convinced there has never been a better time to take what was only once a dream of mine and finally make 3D weather simulations that don't look like red blobs, but instead come alive inside of Unreal Engine. I envision a real-time 3D weather simulation system, and I have found an incredible partner with Geosynergy from Australia to tackle this challenging project. Within only days of sharing my vision with Jeff and Aiden, they've created a simple way for anyone to visualize real-time 3D radar data and 3D wind data. And they've even begun working on leveraging machine learning to instantly turn an image of a tornado into an Niagara tornado actor. We want you to be able to simply drag in realistic storm simulations or turn on real-time weather data and begin telling your story with the power of weather. My name is Adam Skinner, and with the help of Geosynergy, Instant Weather is excited to turn this weather dream into reality. Thank you very much. Any questions? Or I have a question. Great, uh, Adam. Great work. Thank you so much for uh, uh, for creating this app. Uh, actually, my my PhD is in weather radars, and I know cells and cells. So, if there is uh, any need for uh, any contribution on the site, uh, I would be more than uh, glad to contribute. Uh, if you have uh, my email address, we could be in contact, and uh, I'd be more than glad to contribute to the great work you guys do. Thank you. Well, thank, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it's, I love what you're you're doing as well too. It sounds fantastic. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, just wait a couple of our minutes or seconds uh, to see if anybody. There we go. Can I ask okay. you a quick question? To, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. To carry. I mean, it's just a. This is fantastic. This is probably the most impressive weather imagery, radar imagery I've ever seen for Canada. And um, so I commend you on your work with this. Um, I wonder, uh, would you maybe consider reaching out to the to Windy platform to get your data shown on there? On Windy? I mean, Windy's fantastic. I love the way they visualize, uh, you know, the, like the wind barbs and all that kind of stuff. It's it's super cool. So, I mean, yeah, for sure. I'd love to I'd love to collaborate and, and talk with them. Uh, yeah, definitely love Windy. I think it's a great app. So, yeah, definitely. Thanks. And thank you so much for the kind words. Appreciate it. Uh, we do have a question in the chat. So is the app taking only Canadian weather radar or a user would have to upload their own data? Uh, so uh, it's using Canadian uh, radar. We also are going to be processing all of Nexrad radars as well, too. Um, the Amazon bills are interesting for that. 
Um, but uh, yeah, we're definitely uh, going to be tackling all the next rat as well. Um, the ability to upload your own data, we could certainly do that. I mean, if there was some historical data that you had access to, um, whether it be an ODIM H5 or you know MSG31 or whatever format it happens to be, uh, we can definitely uh, we can talk about that and, and tackle that for sure. So uh, for particular use cases, we can definitely do that. And uh, of course, it'd be cool to add the features so that you know there wasn't any friction there. Again, I like removing friction. So if you were able to just click a button, upload your stuff, and, and visualize it, that would be fantastic. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks so much, Adam. If anybody has questions for Adam, um, his email will be listed on the last slide today. Um, you can also put it in the so chat if you'd like right now, Adam. Sure, I will. Yeah, thank you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and invite Dean from Met Ocean to uh, maybe turn on his camera and join us here. Perfect. I'll pass it over to you, Dean. Great. Thank you, Laura. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, it's just a place here slide. Uh, what I wanted to focus on today was communication in four different deployment scenarios that I'm sure most people are familiar with. Uh, one is going to be on, a, a say, a truck or a vehicle of, of some sort in remote locations, just by remote, I mean anywhere that doesn't have cellular coverage. Uh, the second one is a lighthouse, or it doesn't have to be a lighthouse, just any, any kind of weather station or uh, permanent data center. Um, the third one would be uh, the buoy here in the red, and that could be anywhere, uh, anywhere in the sea or uh, the ocean, or it could be in a lake. Um, that's just gathering other weather data or oceanographic data. And the fourth one is going to be on, on an actual vessel, on, on a boat. Uh, and uh, really what's connecting all these four uh, scenarios is the, is the Iridium satellite there. And Iridium, we are an Iridium uh, service provider. And Iridium is, it's, it's truly global coverage or it provides truly global coverage. So that's pole to pole at any altitude. All you need is a clear view of the sky and you can be connected. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the first part of the communication I want to talk about is, is voice communication. Uh, Iridium has two main satellite phones. The one is the, the 9575 Extreme. It's just your typical one-to-one -one communication, uh, like, like a cell phone. And then the other one is the Extreme PTT or push to talk. This enables also the one-to-one -one communication, but also the one-to-many. One so you could use it as, as a, a rate, like a, a radio function, LD. It, both phones do provide uh, S, like SMS and short emails. Um, short emails. Uh, you're not, I mean, you're not going to be able to have uh, Angry Birds on, on other of these phones, but you will be able to talk to anyone, other, other satellite phones or terrestrial phones anywhere on, on the planet. Um, they, they do offer kind of military, military grade ruggedness, which, uh, is, is important. I don't know if anyone has any uh, bad, uh, cell phone experiences. Uh, I definitely have one if I can, uh, as an aside, uh, I was at a beautiful lake taking a picture, which was a perfect time for a mosquito to bite my finger. And then my phone landed on its face on a rock. Uh, I did learn my lesson. I, uh, I no longer take pictures. So, and on, on here, uh, it, it, it does provide a little bit of that, the, the amount of talk time and the amount of standby time on both the, the phone mode or the, the push to talk uh, mode. So, uh, next slide, please. And these, these Iridium phones can be used anywhere uh, whether it be like in, in, in a vehicle, 
um, in again in a lighthouse, or you would have to have a, a direct view of the sky. Um, so working in buildings, there are ways to do that, but it uh, you would need other other features. And then if you are on a boy doing some troubleshooting and you want to do like kind of real time uh, troubleshooting, you could. And then also on on a ship vessel. So it's no matter where you are on the planet, you would be able to have voice communication. Uh, next slide, please. Switching from voice communications to actually data communication, this is uh, uh, something that we're excited about. It's the uh, the Stream Plus, and it allows data uh, everywhere on on the on the planet. And you have two way connectivity, so you can kind of, if uh, for example, if you're at uh, say a, a buoy and you wanted to monitor the status of your oceanographic equipment. You could, you can do that uh, via the Stream Plus, and you can also get real time data uh, while you're sitting uh, in your office or, or anywhere you'd like. Uh, so the, the data speed is up to 22 kilobits upload, 88 download, a uh, little bit about the size. It is fairly light, 620 grams. You do have a couple of different communication protocols, the 232 or the, the RS-485 half duplex, if you wanted to run a longer cable, I think you, you can do anywhere like 400 to 500 meters if, if necessary. And it, it's it's rugged in a sense that the operating conditions, you can go down, to it, it's good from negative 40 degrees up to 70 degrees. Uh, next slide, please. So the stream plus the, the main locations would be again at your quote unquote lighthouse or or on your buoy. And this is a great for, um, in, I mean, previously to this job, I was in the oceanographic field and it is great to be able to see uh, the amount of, uh, or see data real time to make real time decisions, uh, but also to know if, if you're deploying something and you wanna know if your equipment is actually working. Um, this is a, a great asset to have. There's uh, a few things worse than making your deployment wherever you are, coming back a few months later, and then realizing that your equipment didn't work from the very beginning. So you're out, say, three or six months worth of data. Next slide, please. And then the final is the combination of the two of the voice and data communication. And this is with the, the TALUS vessel link. So you can have up to three VoIP lines, uh, high quality voice lines, and you can also do lines within the vessel itself. Um, this, this is a, a little bit more, it's a little higher mass for both the antenna and the below deck unit. So it might not be suitable for something, uh, might not be suitable for, for a, a buoy, but for, for a ship definitely is. You can have Wi-Fi access points uh, on it and up to 12 connected devices while uh, within the vessel as well. Um, so the vessel link is for, for maritime communications or for maritime applications rather. And the mission link is for land-based communications, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's not shown here. It looks very similar. The antenna is more for the maritime, the antenna is a little bit more rounder, uh, but for, for the land-based it's, it's flat. So rather than show the, the land and sea uh, slide again, we can just imagine that this would be on, on the vessel. Next slide, please. Thank you. A uh, little bit about our company, We've been in 40 years. We have 100, 140 employees. We are ISO um, certified and number of different security clearances, and we have three different uh, facilities across the globe. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Does anyone have any questions? I, I might have one. Um, the data that's coming from it, is it strictly for the user or does it get uploaded publicly somewhere? Like is the data, you know, like temperature and pressure and that? It, it's secure, so it would be right from it would be from the device through the Iridium satellites to wherever it would be uh, sent to. Yeah, yeah, it's secure.
right, a few more seconds. Okay, perfect. So um, Dean's contact information will be on the last slide. So if anything uh, comes to your mind, um, feel free to uh, send him a note then. You can also message him in the Zoom chat here. And Dean, you can also list your um, email now if you'd like. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. It's actually my turn. Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, calling this CATIQ in 10 minutes. I hope I can stick to it. So a little bit of background about us. We're uh, Canada's insured loss and exposure indices provider. Um, hopefully through this 10 minute presentation, I'll be able to explain to you what that exactly means. And so uh, CATIQ stands for Catastrophe Indices and Quantification Incorporated. Uh, you can imagine now why we call ourselves CATIQ instead. Um, we uh, started in 2014. Uh, we have been, we were created by the insurance industry mostly. And since inception, we've uh, been guided by an advisory committee made up of insurers, uh, reinsurers, reinsurance brokers, Environment Canada, the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and um, the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. And we are subsidiary of Perils, and that started, that uh, happened in 2019, I believe. Um, I'll explain what we do in Canada, and so what you see what we do, um, Perils does it for 20 other countries in the world. Um, if I can get it, Europe, Turkey, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Japan, Indonesia, um, and I'm sure I'm missing a few, but uh, if you're interested in other parts of the world, um, I encourage you to check out their website. So what we do, uh, the industry needed an organization, an independent organization to collect data from the insurance companies uh, to produce these industry-wide estimates. So we do three things at CATIQ, well, three main things. Uh, the first of which is the cat loss database. Uh, I might refer to catastrophe as cat through this presentation, so I don't mean the animal. Uh, we forecast catastrophes and we um, created and maintain the industry exposure database. So first, uh, what is a catastrophe? Uh, it is an event that causes at least 30 million of insured loss. Now to make it confusing, um, in 2021, at the beginning of the year, we changed that threshold just, you know, with inflation and everything going through, it used to be 25 million. As of 2021, it became 30. It has to affect multiple policyholders. So a policyholder being a homeowner, uh, somebody who has their vehicle insured, um, that would be a policyholder, and multiple insurers. So um, uh, an industry catastrophe has to be kind of widespread. We're not just looking for one, you know, commercial event that affects, you know, two insurance companies um, and just one policyholder. We're not out to just expose what um, one insurance company had to pay out. Um, we're out to, uh, uh, our purpose is to uh, provide in accurate information on what this large event caused in terms of damage. So uh, a little snapshot of what our catastrophe hub looks like. So this is just a small portion of it. Uh, this is an example from the August 2018 Toronto flooding. Uh, so we provide a, uh, a footprint, um, which can be downloaded to KML format and then converted to shape files if you'd like. Um, we also produce a bulletin, uh, so a write-up on you know, the what, when, why, where, how, all the things everybody wants to care about, the little details. Um, if there was a forecast out for it, we'll post it there. So, you know, what did it look like it was going to do before the event unfolded? What was happening as it unfolded? And then this is kind of the post event uh, in Cat Hub. The postal codes under the footprint can be downloaded in um, text file. Uh, the footprint, again, downloadable. Uh, we provide media, so photos, news articles, uh, videos, and then uh, exposure of the footprint. And I'll get more into exposure in a bit. So uh, listed just below all of those arrows are the general summary. So, you know, the date range. Uh, so if a user is going back to look at, um, they wanna find all the events in 2018, or they wanna find all flooding events in for the past five years, um, they'd be able to look at that um, by province and specific locations that were impacted. 
Uh, then we have vital statistics. So uh, things in this case, maximum rainfall, um, what were reported by official reporting stations. Um, we have the industry loss estimate listed there. So this event came in at 160 million of, uh, in 2018 dollars. Um, and then it says CATIQ loss there, but that's really just um, fake company data. So if it was an insurance company, uh, their loss would uh, appear there. Um, on the screen, this is just the 2022 catastrophes. Um, I think we tied for the most this year. Uh, Caroline, if you remember how many we had, feel free. I think it was 16 uh, events, which is an insane number of catastrophes in a year. Um, and we went coast to coast. So from uh, Vancouver Island all the way over to St. John's. And uh, as we mentioned, or as I mentioned, this is, we're not forecasting for the public necessarily. It's more of a stakeholder piece. And so what you see on the screen isn't all events that cause damage. It's all events that caused 30 million or more uh, in damage. So the little tornado icons, you know, those aren't all the tornadoes that happened last year, if you want that, you go to the Northern uh, Tornado Project site, um, who is a partner of ours. Um, but uh, this just is anything related to that catastrophe. And I thought I would show this graphic. Um, I know this one gets passed around quite a bit. So our cat loss database goes back to 2008. And uh, the red bars here are the cat loss cat losses for the year. Um, the gray is, we call external expenses. Um, don't worry too much about those. And then any in the blue is notable events. So uh, an event that causes caused a lot of uh, property damage, but didn't quite uh, cross that catastrophe threshold. So currently the any threshold is 15 to 30 million. Uh, so we see that uh, we do have a slight trend upwards, could be related to a number of things, of course, and in, in, including increased exposure. Um, and uh, last year, we were 3.1 billion, uh, as you can see in the 2022 bar. So the second piece we do is uh, catastrophe forecasting. Uh, what's showing on screen is the forecast that was issued for Hurricane Fiona last September. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to see it, but uh, there's a gradient of colors with a darker green uh, being the higher risk area for property damage. Um, we have three different levels, uh, low, moderate, and high. Again, all relating to that $30 million threshold. Is it a low risk that it's going to cross that threshold, moderate or high? And we provide the footprint, um, the detailed you know, write-up as to timing, types of perils. Um, types of perils can be very important um, just because not all insurance companies uh, write for flood or sewer backup. I'll say most how home policies cover um, wind, fire, and hail. So um, that's not usually too much of an issue. But when water is uh, coming into play, um, there's a big question mark about what um, the companies might be exposed to. And the third piece is the industry exposure database. So I might refer to it as the IED. So exposure basically means the total sums insured information. So to make it very simple, if um, a fire, a wildfire, um, you know, just homes uh, catching on fire um, were to be destroyed in a specific area. Um, the number that we have is what the industry stands to lose. Um, so, you know, it's unlikely a, a hailstorm will completely destroy an area. Um, so it's likely, uh, unlikely that um, the exposure to hail would be, you know, 100% or in a, in a hailstorm. Um, but uh, in terms of fire, you can think of it like that. Um, so it's for the variables listed on the left. Uh, so risk counts being, you know, my house would be a risk. Um, building value and vehicle value contents. Um, BI, business interruption, and ALE is additional living expense. So those are the non-physical damage pieces. Um, so business interruption, you know, if you, uh, let's go with the ice storm that happened two weeks ago. So there was extended power outages. So businesses might not have been able to operate. So the, if they have this insurance in their insurance policy to be uh, paid out, if they don't have any revenue coming in, um, then the insurance company is paying out to that. So that would be included as a loss to us, um, but in its own category as non-physical damage. Uh, and ALE is the personal property side of that. So if there's a flood in my basement, um, I'm jinxing myself for these things. If there is, um, <laughs> if you can't live in your home for a time period or a wildfire evacuation, 
um, and you have to live in a hotel or you have to eat your meals out of your house, um, those expenses are non-physical damage. So the insurance company is um, paying out as a result of the event, but it's not direct damage from the, the peril, the hazard. So this is by FSA, which is the forward sortation area, the first three characters of the postal code, uh, by natural peril that's listed there in the middle, and by line of business, so personal, commercial, and auto. And this is updated once a year. Uh, we're actually just uh, getting close to releasing the year-end 2022 data, and it's done for all of Canada. And uh, when we release this, uh, we also started collecting loss data at that resolution, so at that FSA level, um, for any event that exceeds 250 million. So just the, the, the bigger events that everybody really wants to know more details about. Uh, so currently we have uh, back to year end 2016 uh, through 2021, um, and some other things you can do with the um, cap watch and outlook forecast is look at what the industry is exposed to, or if you're an insurance company, you can uh, look at what your own ex exposure is uh, to the forecast. So who uses CAIQ? Um, we have mostly stakeholders, but uh, insurance companies, reinsurance, reinsurance brokers, all levels of government, I'll say um, the lower uh, in that, so like a municipality, they've used it for, you know, return on investment projects. Um, modelers and academics also uh, use CAT-IQ data. Um, we have a few NGOs and NFPs as well. Okay, and the last thing I want to mention is uh, we host the Canadian Catastrophe Conference. Uh, the next one is in February next year in Toronto, uh, and it's for industry, academia, and government. Um, all of those uh, professions that are listed in the bullet points, if uh, you're involved in any of those, uh, might be of interest to you. Um, and we talk about all things catastrophe from preparation, mitigation, uh, to response to, um, you know, best practices and what happens. So uh, website is at the bottom. And I just want to say thank you, everyone, for um, letting me speak today and uh, happy to answer any questions. I'm I'm sure I'm at 10 minutes. So I'm happy if you just send me an email or a note in the chat and I don't have to take anything live here. Um, just in interest of time. But yeah. Thank you. Um, perfect. Okay. Uh, we have Matthew from ASL next. Ah, thank you. Um, do you mind if I share from my end or? Uh, no, absolutely. Go for it. Just uh, give me a second there. All right, so what do you got that one? <laughs> 2016. <laughs> Fort McMurray wildfire. <laughs> 3.6 billion of insured loss and economic loss, which you know includes everything in addition to insured loss, um, I think it was about double that, so closer to seven. All right, sorry, I've just got the one screen here. I just got to get everything out of the way. <laughs> Looks good. All right. Um, so, uh, all right. Okay, so uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you uh, for uh, the last uh, presentation. It was quite interesting. I uh, um, so I'm. Matthew Aspen. I'm here to uh, talk a bit about ASL environmental sciences. I am a uh, presently a Med Ocean and Arctic uh, project manager with the company. I've been with the company going on now for about uh, 10 years in capacity as a postdoctoral fellow following my PhD at the University of Manitoba studying sea ice. And now I do more generalized work. I'm uh, working with um, uh, renewable energy projects, offshore marine energy, as well as projects with Indigenous peoples on uh, on all three of our coasts. So a little uh, corporate overview of ASL. It uh, was founded in 1977 to uh, provide oceanographic services to um, mainly the Arctic. It's mainly an Arctic uh, heritage, and uh, hence the A in ASL is originally named Arctic Sciences Limited. And uh, the focus uh, on uh, currents, waves, water pro properties, sea ice. Uh, this is uh, original founders, uh, David Fissel, John Marco, David Lemon. And um, the, uh, so, so these, uh, they built the, pro the company over the years, working um, initially on oceanographic work in the Arctic archipelago. 
and uh, started doing uh, work for the uh, offshore oil and gas industry in the Arctic because there was a rather large rush of uh, exploration in the uh, Beaufort Delta in the late 70s and early 80s. And uh, so that enabled the company to grow. And in 1996, the uh, product division of ASL was formed with the launch of the ASL ice profiling sonar. And I'll get to that in a minute, a bit more detail. In uh, the company continued to grow with uh, additional offshore projects uh, taking place uh, now and uh, going into places like Newfoundland and uh, across the water into uh, uh, Southeast Asia. In fact, one of our uh, one of our first big projects back in the day uh, was before my time was uh, off Sakhalin Island uh, in Russia in Russian waters. So. Um, in any case, the uh, map there shows you our scope uh, today, sort of where we've been uh, everywhere with our various types of projects. And uh, you can see we've become a global company now. In 2009, we merged with uh, Gary Borstad Associates, GA Borstad. Uh, I was a remote sensing company so that uh, ASL could have an ASL uh, or an ASL based uh, remote sensing division that would uh, couple up with our existing Med Ocean uh, division and provide another layer of services to existing clients, as well as uh, reaching into some new areas, some more terrestrial based clients. Um, as uh, as of July 2022, we do have a new president. Uh, Jan Bermans has been appointed the president and CEO, and uh, Jan is also a mechanical engineer and uh, is uh, quite uh, uh, keen on bringing the company forward into the future. So, and uh, myself as well as uh, as I've said here, we've we've built our company on a history of a lot of oil and gas uh, exploration and uh, and support work, working under uh, ISO Med Ocean 1990 one standards and uh we're at a point now where we're uh, we're working to actively pivot the company away from uh, from offshore oil and gas being you know primary revenue source and more of a more of a legacy legacy revenue source as we're looking at more and more projects with offshore renewables indigenous peoples academics and government a more diversified approach to fit into canada's blue economy so uh, just some quick images of what we do. So we obviously, uh, we run uh, field programs with uh, technicians, various uh, types of offshore and subsea marine equipment. We do have a research and development arm with our products line, starting with the uh, ice profile and sonar. We have some other interesting products that have come out, as well as uh, in-house data analysis and reporting to clients. We're a full, um, full turnkey service company. So essentially, you would come to us and either purchase or lease sensors for the needs that you have for an oceanographic survey. Then we can uh, build a, a mooring design that's appropriate for the site. Uh, we consider things like depth, underwater features, currents, uh, local uh, geological conditions, decide on what the best mooring design is for the given situation. And we provide all the services from uh, deployment, recovery, experimental design, and then uh, collecting the data and processing it into uh, basic data sets that can be taken away and given to the client, or they can be uh, run through more advanced uh, statistics, such as our extremal ice statistics uh, calculations that we've been doing for uh, for iOS for, for several decades now. Um, some other services we offer through our data processing, we just launched a new uh, range of bioacoustics and hydroacoustic data processing as well as some AI driven routines to uh, to enhance our uh, our data quality and cleaning uh, routines and also uh, and also for uh, for analysis we uh, have been developing a lot of our package over the 45 year history of our company but some of these ones i mentioned more have been more recently in the last few years with some new talent that we brought on board we also have a large lease pool of equipment, uh, so I'm not going to verbatim list everything that's in there. If you're interested in that, you can go to uh, asl.com lease.html and see there. Um, we have a number of ADCPs, our own ice profiling sonars, our AZFPs, acoustic zooplankton fish profilers, and CTs, dissolved oxygen loggers, you name it, we probably have it. And uh, we offer these out uh, as lease only. So you take the equipment away, do your thing, give it back, or we can do a full service project base. And uh, we technically offer some discounts if we're involved with the, uh, with the field work and the data processing. So as I said, we're, uh, we've, we're built, our history is on oil and gas, a lot of presence in the Arctic uh, in the early days. So you can see our 
uh, research projects marked in red there. We, we have done some work with icebergs and uh, the Baffin Island, looking at uh, iceberg drift trajectories over, over the years, as well as uh, work off the east coast of Greenland and Fram Strait in partnership with NPI. But all the yellow dots you see there are, of course, oil and gas companies. And you'll see a lot of big major names there that uh, you'll probably recognize. And uh, But what we were doing now is uh, we are looking at uh, addressing offshore marine structures as more of a generalized market. So it's not just oil and gas. We're, we're looking to kind of shift away from that and get more onto the, the left side of the figure that you see here. So we, are, we do currently have some work with um, some tidal projects on both coasts in the east and west. Uh, we're exploring one with an indigenous community. And uh, we've also got our uh, first offshore floating uh, wind project uh, lining up uh, pretty quick, which is really exciting for us. So a bit about our products. Um, so this is the ice profiling sonar. Um, again, I, I'm not going to read all this, but uh, essentially it's based on uh, active acoustics. It sends out a ping that says uh, then the backscatter is measured by the receiver. And uh, we use an ADCP and bottom tracking mode that allows us to uh, calculate ice velocity data and at about a 10 to 15 minute interval. And uh, this instrument can be configured to sample at uh, any rate you want. It can be up to, uh, up to continuous data collection. We can, uh, we can cycle it uh, with uh, power management settings so that a single deployment can last up to three years if we're really creative about it. And uh, we've used this, of course, in many applications, polar science, offshore oil and gas, but also real-time support for navigation, uh, AUV instrumentation packages. And uh, we also have a shallower water version, which we call the SWIP, the Shallow Water Ice Profiler. And we've been uh, we've had some projects with uh, Manitoba Hydro and BC Hydro and uh, other organizations interested in frozen rivers and frazzle ice. So another major project, or sorry, product that we've uh, been offering for about, uh, it's about 12, 13 years now is uh, based on active acoustics as well. It's our uh, active zooplankton and fish profiler. And typically we offer this as a quad frequency instrument that uh, enables us to look at the, the entire water column, or at least the water column to effective ranges for the given frequencies we're working with. And it allows us to get these uh, volume uh, backscatter density plots that we can then uh, further process with some of our newer um, hydroacoustic processing algorithms I mentioned earlier to uh, get down to uh, potentially species identification. That's ultimately the goal. But uh, for now, what we can do is get a, a, a density and, um, and, and give you an idea of motion in the water column over time. So you can see plankton and small schools of fish that move up to the water surface and come back down. And it's uh, you get a time series of this, it's really quite interesting. You can profile how active, how biologically active an area is. So we're really hoping that this is something that uh, will be uh, you know of keen interest to the offshore wind world, because we know that there's already some uh, ecological implications of offshore floating wind that are emerging that are of concern to uh, to fisheries and uh, large marine mammals. So uh, we've had many representative customers around the world there. I'm not going to read verbatim. So uh, looking at some examples of organisms and the different frequencies and the approximate particle sizes there, I'll just let you kind of look through there. But as you can see, we go from copiopods right down to uh, the larger fish at, uh, at uh, appropriate ranges. We have one of these uh, devices on the uh, Ocean Networks Canada uh, Venus platform as, a, as an example. And 2014, 2015, we were selected by the US Ocean um, Observatory Program for uh, global and regional observations. So AZFP ICE is our new uh, and improved version of essentially both. We're, we're looking to merge together the capabilities of the AZFP and the ICE profiler to uh, essentially offer this in a single package. So you don't have to buy two instruments, you can just buy one. So you'd have a quad uh, frequency AZFP with an ICE profiler. And um, it, uh, it's something that we're uh, just bringing to market now. We uh, there's another uh, uh, stream of ASL called AQ Flow that is uh, focused on acoustic measurements of uh, of uh, flow water flow through turbines at hydro dams. This is a acoustic scintillation flow meter. I am not an expert on this topic, but I can connect you to people that are. If you're into the hydroelectric world and are interested about uh, regulating your flow through your turbines to uh, to maximize uh, energy production. 
Uh, Wave Profiler is a, another product that we offer that's based off our ice uh, profiling sonar. It's uh, essentially very similar to the ice profiler in that it can collect long-term uh, site-specific data of height and significant, significant weight height and period um, for, uh, for, for wave climatology. So this is really good for long-term deployments, although many of you might be more interested in, uh, in using buoys so you can get direction. The image recorder for Imagenics. Imagenics is a side scan sonar company based in Port Coquitlam. Uh, we have a product that allows uh, logging of their uh, side scan imagery uh, that uh, has been has been used widely on uh, remotely operated vehicles. ASL is also a reseller for a number of uh, oceanographic brands uh, such as Teledyne, Deepwater Buoyancy, Hemisphere, Trimble, Veilport, and Vera. And we do this through a partnership with Dasco Equipment. Dasco is based in Halifax, and we are, of course, based here in uh, in Victoria. So uh, we share Canada on a uh, regional basis, and uh, uh, ASL also represents uh, Dasco and these parties for Alaska. So just a quick uh, few notes on our remote sensing services. Um, we've combined our decades of experience from the Borstad team and uh, domain knowledge with new state-of-the-art technologies, data, and analytical capabilities. So in fact, many of our uh, AI and uh, newer generation uh, uh, programmers are part of our remote sensing team primarily in working with uh, data from aquatic and terrestrial environments using data acquired from optical, thermal, radar sensors, board satellites, and aerial platforms. And of course, we're leveraging these new technologies. So some examples of areas we work with our remote sensing team, of course, coastal habitat, uh, looking at intertidal and nearshore habitat. There's a lot of interest, of course, with the uh, 2021 heat dome event that caused uh, widespread uh, ocean uh, uh, critter death in uh, tidal zones. That was, uh, that's, that's an event we hope we don't see again in our lives. But um, uh, in any case, uh, we also look at aquatic, so like such as water properties, uh, water chemistry, uh, certain properties of water chemistry like chlorophyll, dissolved organics, suspended sediments, as well as uh, water quality and uh, general descriptive oceanography and uh, limnology. We're doing we do work in lakes as well. And then, last but not least, we uh, we don't forget our heritage of working with ice and in the Arctic. So we still do, of course, ice mapping and characterization with our with all of our people. Some other areas, environment and change, like mapping change over, over area. We, uh, for example, we did a uh, Beaufort, um, uh, sorry, Mackenzie Delta mapping a project many years ago, looking at change in vegetation from uh, natural disturbances, storm surges, et cetera. We also do um, mapping around industrial activities, mine reclamation, uh, using uh, hyperspectral and multispectral surveys. And last but not least, we do, uh, ASL has a uh, top series, top secret uh, security clearance for certain individuals that can work on uh, defense and security projects with the Department of National Defense. I'm not one of those people, but uh, we do have uh, a secure facility that we we operate in so we can take these types of uh, projects. So as a summary, we've uh, I hope I've, I've outlined some competitive advantages in certain niches such as Arctic ice and remote sensing, uh, mooring design. We are, uh, we've got 45 years plus experience on mooring design. If uh, there's an underwater subsea environment, you need a mooring, we know how to do it. There's uh, a breadth of acoustics expertise, old expertise, new expertise, young expertise, diverse expertise. It's all there. We also have our uh, growing lease pool that we're, uh, we're always refreshing with new equipment. And uh, we make use of things like uh, the SRED for uh, in-house research and development. We do usually budget about 10% of revenues toward uh, um, research and basic research in-house, in whether it be right from just scientific uh, analysis of ice data right up to a development of new, new systems and uh, real-time monitoring, things like that. So uh, I've listed many of our blue chip customers, a lot of those oil and gas names, but now we're looking more at things like major marine energy uh, companies out there like uh, like Blue Float, big big engineering companies like Acom and uh, and uh, well WSB are on the, the call here. Be another one, uh, uh, Senko, things like that. And last but not least, we uh, we continue our collaborations uh, with iOS uh, with some new faces that have uh, joined the team there as well as with the University of Victoria, Dalhousie, and uh, ArcticNet, as it's in its, uh, I guess, its final years here, unfortunately. But 
Um, many more to list, Amundsen Science, Social Networks Canada. Uh, as you can see, we collaborate uh, academically right across the board in Canada and uh, throughout the world. So our future is uh, really uh, what we're looking at here. It's it's getting ASL firmly into uh, into the blue economy as leaders of uh, uh, doing subsea subsea research and support for offshore marine energy and other sustainable uh, blue economy activities such as kelp farming and uh, sustainable fisheries and ocean management plants with indigenous uh, communities. And uh, ultimately, uh, bringing ourselves to be able to put out whole ecosystem observatories that uh, can uh, that can be customized and offer custom hydroacoustic data process processing where uh, where needed. And uh, I'm not going to go too long on these. I'm just going to cycle through these quickly. These are just some project and partnership examples that we've done recently. A few GISs, one for the Canadian government, one for the Greenland uh, Ice Data Service. Um, marine renewable energy projects. We have been working actively with developers at the Force platform and the Bay of Fundy. The pictures you see are from some older imagery of some early offshore renewable energy we're doing in BC. One was the Race Rocks Tidal Study. One was the Nikoon Wind Project, which I guess unfortunately hasn't fully constructed yet, but I, I know it's still out there as a, as a concept. Uh, we do real-time current and water leveling monitoring for the Port of Vancouver as well as uh, an ongoing sediments and erosion study in Lake Michigan with Stantec. And uh, also another final, my final slide is uh, just the summary slide of this big marine Arctic ecosystem study we did in uh, partnership with the uh, Nuviala Development Corporation, Stantec and uh, CERNAC looking at um, the marine, a marine Arctic ecosystem study right across a mooring line set out just east of the American uh, Yukon border. And this project wrapped up, uh, I guess, about a year, year and a bit ago. But it was it was quite a large one, as you can see, many partners from industry ranging across to American um, institutions. So anyway, I think that's probably more than uh, ten minutes. So thank you for the time, and uh, I open to questions. Thanks. If anybody has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or enter it into the chat. We might have time for one. I know I have one, but I don't want to take away the one chance for someone else. Okay. Um, so I'll just go ahead and ask it. Um, so you mentioned you do ice monitoring, and then I saw at the end you had a project on um, water level monitoring. I was curious, is ice jams something, ice jam forecasting, something that ASL does? It's... Um, yeah. It's something that we've been actively um, exploring and uh, if if whatever pursuing prospects. Um, I was recently uh, out in Winnipeg uh, speaking to uh, I was speaking to the head of the civil engineering department at the University of Manitoba, and that of course is one of their one of their big topics of study is uh, and uh, we have had a uh, shallow water ice profiler that's been uh, that's been leased out to their group in the past. but um, I guess, Right now, we aren't doing anything actively, but it, it is something that we are certainly interested in in supporting, whether it be Manitoba or BC or St. Lawrence, wherever. <laughs> yeah, I asked because uh, 2020, the Fort McMurray ice jam uh, that they had was a costly one. Yeah, um, exactly. They can they happen really quickly, right? Like in the water level comes up, like just, yeah, it's... Uh, it's definitely an area that we would be uh, we would be really happy to explore supporting more. Okay, yeah. okay thank you. Um, I haven't seen anything else come through, um, but uh, Matthew's contact information will be available uh, on the last slide. So now I'm going to invite Scott Kaler to uh, present. Um, present. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen again. Share. Thanks, Laura, and thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Next slide. So for my presentation, I'll go through a few things, just a brief weather logics history about our company, the sectors of business we work in, some of what we see coming in the future, and then time for some questions at the end. Uh, next. Next. So weather logics has been around for about seven years now. It was founded by myself and my colleague, Matt DeSorci. We were both University of Manitoba uh, graduate, or I was a graduate student in meteorology and 
Uh, Matt was uh, a student in the bachelor program. When we graduated, we saw an opportunity to start a private sector meteorology firm focused on forecasting. Uh, the private sector in meteorology is small in Canada today, and it was even smaller, arguably, back then. So we saw this opportunity to, to get into business and haven't looked back since. So we're a, a private federal corporation. Uh, we employ uh, meteorologists and Matt and myself, and then most of our other staff tend to be developers as uh, this is a very technology heavy sector with all of the data that's involved. So uh, we're about half developers and half a meteorologist. Next. So initially in our early days, most of the work we did was focused on agriculture forecasting. So you're looking at a map here showing kind of how we uh, provided forecasts for farmers by region in Manitoba. Now back, uh, let's say a decade or two decades ago, regional forecasting is kind of the model that was used, but over time that's evolved now more to a grid system. So I'll show how that works in a moment, but um, things started off pretty simple, uh, focused on agriculture in Manitoba. We've since expanded to Saskatchewan and Alberta. So we only do prairie farmers at the moment because um, not that weather doesn't matter to farmers in other parts of the country, but on the prairies, it's a bit unique in that people are very spread out, often far from weather stations and so on. Uh, next. After we did agriculture, next thing we kind of started doing was road weather predictions. So uh, we have done work for the city of Winnipeg ever since we started, and we've expanded to other municipalities and uh, trucking uh, companies since then. So we've, you know, this is an example of some of the early work we did. Um, we have much more advanced products now, but that was kind of our start in that area. Uh, as part of this, we developed uh, road weather forecasting model using machine learning, which we still use, and machine learning continues to be a very important part of the future of meteorology, and, and we found that it works actually very well for road weather prediction. Uh, next. So as I mentioned, over time, the forecasting model has evolved uh, in most organizations from a regional system to a grid-based system. So on the, the right panel, you're seeing the graphical forecast editor this is software which was developed in the United States for the National Weather Service. It's now kind of the industry standard for making weather forecasts where meteorologists intervene and edit grids. It's getting to be an old technology now. It's close to 25 years old, but a lot of companies are still using this. A lot of National Meteorological Services are as well. And this is what we've been using for a number of years to edit forecasts uh, for clients who require edited forecasts. We also have a modeling system. so. We stream things either into automated forecasts based on our model or our uh, forecast can be edited in the GFE using uh, that model and meteorologist intervention. From there, the products then go into an app or other means of delivery based on what the client needs. Uh, next. And next. So now just going through the sectors of business we work in, I'll start with agriculture. This has always been the largest and most important for us and continues to be, although we've expanded a number of other areas since we got going in the early days. Uh, so basically what we're doing for farmers is providing a forecast specific to every farm. So if you subscribe, typically a farm on average these days is about 2000 acres. For those that don't know what an acre is, um, that size of farm is roughly one square mile or um, a few square kilometers. But most farms are, well, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of farms are significantly larger than that. It's not uncommon on the prairies to see farms of uh, tens of thousands of acres now. It's a, it's a business of scale increasingly with the cost. So uh, small time farming still exists, but the big business in agriculture are these massive farms who cover uh, many square miles. So they need detailed information, especially around precipitation, that's probably the single most important thing they want is accurate rainfall forecasts. So we're doing short and long-term forecasts, spray forecasting, uh, predicting uh, things like inversions, which are very important when you're spraying chemicals over a crop, especially in the very open prairie environment. Uh, disease modeling, predicting crop-related diseases is, uh, you know, weather is a very large factor in that. So that's one thing that's important. And then precipitation and hail monitoring also uh, very important for farms, especially these ones now that are spread over such massive areas. 
Uh, next. So an example of a spray forecast for a farm, all the factors involved in spraying based on the government criteria for what is the ideal conditions for spraying. You might think that calm winds are best for spraying, but actually not. Calm is often associated with an inversion. If you have an atmospheric inversion, the spray particles will drift off the field somewhere else and not be effective or affect another neighbor, which you don't want. So this kind of gives you all the factors and then ranks the spray condition. So really the ideal spray weather is to have light winds roughly five to 15 kilometers per hour is, is just about perfect. Next. Also with new technology, especially with our new weather radars, which are increasingly better at tracking precipitation, we can now give precipitation data for any location on the prairies or really any location in Canada using gridded precipitation analyses. And so I'm showing a table of the precipitation from our automated system last year versus my weather station. And the automated uh, precipitation analysis grids that are available now, which assimilate things like radar and all the provincial weather stations and so on, the difference between that analysis and my actual weather station for the entire year was only 12 millimeters. And then you can do the same thing for temperature data. And the difference between an actual weather station and the analysis was only 0.1 degree for the year. So we're getting to the point now where weather stations still have a lot of value, but there's ways of tracking these things without the need for that equipment. And when you're a farmer who's got land spread everywhere, not having to put in weather stations on all these different fields uh, can be quite valuable. Next. Another industry we work in is insurance. We mainly do hailstorm monitoring in this business. Uh, so here you're looking at a, a map showing all of our hail reports and the uh, hail uh, damage from our partner companies. So we do both property insurance and crop insurance. Uh, we maintain the largest national data, database of verified hail reports in Canada. And we use things like weather radar to produce specialized mapping on a daily basis of both hail size and things like kinetic energy. For some companies, we also monitor hailstorms in real time and identify where they might be causing damage. And as of last year, we've partnered with the Northern Hail Project. So we're working with them on a number of things, both data sharing and perhaps doing a better job of uh, making available products which forecast hail in advance. Next. And uh, next, those are just some examples of hail maps at the top. Uh, another industry which I mentioned is transportation. So we do road weather predictions across North America. Here you're looking at our app, which shows in the background the forecast for major highways showing the road conditions. You can look at other layers as well, blowing snow, temperatures, wind, really anything you need. And if I were to zoom in on that, you know, all the regional roads appear as well. So what trucking companies will do is they can look at the weather that's happening right now, and they can also schedule in alerts. So let's say they are driving from uh, Toronto to Vancouver very often. They could enter that as a route, and whenever specific criteria that their company cares about are expected to be exceeded, they'll get an automated alert. So it's all about automating the alert process using the forecast data that's out there, and that allows companies to really tailor these alerts to exactly what they care about. Next. And lastly, government services. So um, we've done a lot of uh, work in road weather for municipalities over the years. Uh, we also do fire weather prediction. Uh, we've done uh, fire weather forecasting for the Yukon for a number of years. And um, we, we um, uh, also have done special projects like um, software development for uh, precipitation forecasting of flood models, things like that. So a variety of different types of services for governments. Next, and just some miscellaneous other things. So, you know, we kind of run consulting on the side as a parallel stream of service to what, what our fixed products are. So we tend to do a lot of conference presentations. Uh, there's so much interest in weather and agriculture and a lot of big conferences. So we do a lot of that type of stuff, especially in the winter. Uh, custom research projects. We just did one uh, about uh, extreme precipitation in BC and how it's affecting infrastructure. And we maintain a pretty um, strong social media presence, especially around um, prairie uh, weather, where you know, we've got a big base of clients who are very interested in, in the conditions there. Next. Next. So as far as the future goes, just a few thoughts on kind of how we see things 
moving forward. The role of the meteorologist has been changing for a long time, but it's starting to get to the point where it's coming to a head and in, in that meteorologists will in the future really not be that involved in day-to-day -day forecasting. The modeling that's out there, particularly the blended models that are available, um, both our modeling system and others like the uh, national blend of models that the U.S. is producing, show that they consistently beat meteorologists' forecasts. But that's not to say the meteorologist doesn't have a role. It's more now in those really extreme or unusual events, especially ones where communication is important. Models aren't, they're just data points, so we still need to communicate that well. Uh, so meteorologists will have a role in that. Also really a big role in computing, uh, developing the algorithms and models to uh, display this data to clients. And also using all of the new modeling capabilities we have, especially high resolution models, to provide more applied services. So uh, road weather continues to be really important. And I think there's a, a really big market for uh, better road weather prediction, not just for organizations, but just for the public who, who really need that when they're traveling. Uh, agriculture impact models, I showed some examples of that, but going forward, we need to do a better job of using our forecast data and apply that to how our customers actually uh, require or actually use the data in practice. So more applied services and more role on on just focused on unusual events as opposed to day-to-day -day forecasting is kind of the direction we see things going. So I think that's all I had. If you had any questions, happy to answer them now. Perfect. Give it a few seconds for any questions for Scott. Yeah, go ahead, Adam. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Um, great presentation. I, I love what you're doing at WL. Uh, I really like the uh, the model posts you make on, on Twitter and social media. Um, can you can you try to explain how your uh, your blend is different from the national blend of models? Uh, so our blend is very similar to the national blend of models. However, the national blend, the issue, there's no issue with it. But from our perspective, it's not. Um, we have problems using it for Canada because they are blending together high resolution models and global models. And that results in what I call a seam or a change in resolution midway through the prairies, which is a critical area for us. So, you know, we could use the national blend for a lot of areas, but we cover all of the prairies and also the Arctic where the national blend may or may not be ingesting all of the data that they envision because their data is focused on the United States. So we've made our model consistent across North America but using a lot of the same principles as the national blend. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like the where the her cuts off and where the the nan three k and all that, right? It's yeah, exactly. It's, uh, I'm sure it switches to twelve k in resolution all of a sudden. So yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Cool. Thank you very much. I'll ask a question. Uh, hi, Scott. Um, so hi, uh, Matt. Hi. <laughs> um, I just. Hypothetically, I mean, I, I'm not volunteering for this or anything, but um, what you guys do with your road forecasting system is really quite interesting to me and in, uh, in a local sense, because here in, uh, in coastal BC and, and mountain BC as well, we have a lot of these marginal events where um, it's not quite cold enough to snow, like fluffy, dry, you know, 10 to 1 snow, but it's we get these events where uh, there's cold air pulled aloft and it's dragging the cold air down as the heavy rates of precipitation are happening and it tends to drag the wet snow down uh down the side of the uh the, the elevation profile and sometimes it reaches right down to sea level when we're not not really expecting it and it can put challenges on the uh, construction industry transportation and uh, just general civic operations and um I'm just wondering if you see an opportunity to uh, to reach out and try to set up an office here in BC and take what you do and your existing system and apply it with some local knowledge here. You know, there's there's definitely more of an opportunity. Well, there's an opportunity everywhere, but more of an opportunity in areas of complex terrain where a lot of the more regionally based forecasts or forecasts that are focused on major cities aren't really getting down to the detail that we need. So our model does already work in BC, but 
I think for those areas of high high and complex terrain, we might even want to consider uh, using specialized higher resolution models, either from national meteorological organizations or even running our own model for some of these areas, and then maybe allowing, you know, if there were a lot of clients in that area, allowing a meteorologist to modify that a bit. So it's, as someone who, who lives in the flattest part of the country, probably it's hard for me to sink my teeth into right now, but uh, I definitely agree that there's an opportunity there if if we were to dive into it a bit more. Yeah, no, I I, I respect that. I mean, I, I lived there with, in Manitoba for seven years and I know how very different our two climates are, but uh, it's uh, I, I think there's an opportunity. But anyways, thanks. <laughs> So maybe I'll end there. Um, Laura, did we have our final speaker yeah. log in? Yeah, Ray is on. So uh, now I'd like to invite Ray Garnett from Agroclimatic Consulting uh, to tell us a little bit about what they do. Uh, you're just on mute, Ray. You're still on mute. If I can, I'm gonna okay. Hear me now? Yeah. Perfect. I can't see anybody else, but I'll I'll just go ahead. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. I write a climate and crop letter twice a month, primarily for grain producers over the Canadian prairies, and it's very much like I used to do for the Canadian wheat board. I work for board in the weather and crop surveillance section for decades. And uh, I monitor all the global rain growing areas of the world like the Canadian Wheat Board used to do. My letter has, uh, has two letters I put out. It's quite lengthy as a highlight section. And I look at all the major growing, growing areas, as I said earlier. And I look at impacts as to what's happening. And this is all really relates to crop yields. And my yield is, is, is well, weather and crop yield. And so each section that I have is mainly broken down in key areas, states, Canada, Europe, China, India, Australia, Argentina, all the major grain growing areas. And I have an impact assessment as to what's happening to crops. And I focus really at critical growing periods. And I also have what's called a risk assessment aspect of it. And I endeavor to forecast about three weeks to three months in advance, and that's globally using various algorithms and such, but largely based on El Nino Southern Oscillation. There's other drivers I look at, like the stratospheric wind reversal, solar activity, smoke cover extent, all of which drive weather conditions or can, or crops. I endeavor to outperform the USDA. Each, every year, month, they come out with numbers as to what the crop yield is in all the various grain growing areas, U.S. corn or soybeans beans or Argentinian corn, doesn't matter, but they attempt to estimate yields. So what I do is try to come out before they come out and have greater accuracy towards the end. And sometimes after harvest, it can take months before they really zero into the final yield. It kind of floats and moves around a bit. I use essentially large scale indices, algorithms that I've developed they're all in the public domain, and it's referenced in my climate letter that I send out uh, twice a month. And uh, I use remote sensing aspects as well that's available to me to try to confirm weather and crop conditions and aid in the assistance of estimating yield. Um, sometimes I think everything I do is in the public domain, and I don't feel at liberty to just share everything that I do and how I do it. As I say, there's all in the peer reviewed literature if you want to see just exactly how I do things. Some of it's novel or was novel about 20 years ago. It's not novel anymore, I suppose. Methodology. It's, uh, what else can I say? I verify forecasts in my climate letter as to how well I've done. I try to forecast weather as well as yields. And I do a verification of all my various forecasts, which is contained in the climate letter. And uh, so that's another aspect of it. Often I'll send complimentary climate letters to people that might have an interest. And I have enough clients over the prairies that makes it worthwhile. I'm a pensioner. I make 
most of my money through pensions, complements my pensions and everything, that's just fine. And uh, I focus on things like world food security. And I look at grain prices, grain prices are high right now. And we're also in a weather market. In other words, the grain market is, is highly dependent nowadays with what, what, what's happening in weather because stocks to usage ratios are very low lowest in 10 years in some cases. So it's uh, if you're a farmer, you're probably gonna be watching the weather a little closer than normal. And I track global temperatures and such. And I track climatic extremes, it has a glossary in it so that anybody that doesn't understand certain terms, it all, it's all put forth in the glossary. And one of the things I often do in my climate letters, I will consistently do is I refute anthrop anthropogenic global warming. I am a staunch skeptic of human induced global warming. And uh, whenever I hear the word emissions, it raises a flag with me. And I say emissions of what? And because they're really talking about carbon dioxide, which is plant food, it's not a pollutant and such. So I'm, a, I'm skeptical about all this talk about human induced global warming. Um, and that's about it. I don't know what else to say, but it gives you a rough idea of what I do. And uh, I'm going to a conference. I'm going to the Canadian Geophysical Union Conference, also the Canadian Society for Agricultural Meteorology, a joint conference. And that happens in early May. I'll be presenting there on, on uh, global warming, climatic extremes, and our cold extremes on the rise, because it looks to me the weather is, the globe has been cooling since about 2020. Uh, so, and that's actually a fairly, farmers are interested in that, and uh, they're not too happy about some of these policies that the federal government has with respect to fertilizers being pollutants and all this kind of stuff, and they're being a little bit intrusive, I think, with farmers and all the things that they're asking to do to, to comply with the uh, the government's position that we have a global warming problem, et cetera. And that's about it. Have I covered five minutes? I think I have. And that's essentially what I do. I can't see anybody, I, but I can. I know I can see myself and Laura, and that's about it. So <laughs> anyway, I've given you what I think for what I do and why I do it. Thanks, Ray. Does anybody have any questions for Ray? Climatic early warning for grain producers on the farmers. That's basically what I'm doing. Okay. All right. Um, I do have his email on the next slide. So um, I'll uh, pass it over to Scott Kaler to uh, wrap up the session. I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen on that. Thank you, Ray. I just want to give everyone a one last chance, if you had any questions for anybody who spoke today, feel free to jump in. We have a few minutes left. Um, and while you, if you have one, raise your hand or put it in the chat. And, and while you're doing that, I'm just going to wrap up by uh, thanking all of our presenters today. Uh, it was great to have all of you share what you're doing in meteorology and climate services in Canada. And um, I see we do have a question. Um, this one's for Ray. It's uh, from Neil. He says, I'd be interested if you can produce a model that explains temperature changes over the last century without anthropogenic emissions of greenhouse gases. So I don't, maybe more of a comment, but. I can give you a graph that I publish in my climate letter on a regular basis. And it's the best that I know of in terms of assessing global temperatures since about 1979, and satellite based. Okay, and don't see any other questions at the moment, but um, you've got one last chance here. Uh, so yeah, thanks to all of our presenters today. Um, on behalf of the private sector committee, uh, it's really exciting to see all that's going on out there. As a committee, we've got um, pretty much a full roster now, so we're not looking to recruit any new members this year, but in future years, as uh, some of our members um, you know, come and go, we may be looking to add. But that doesn't mean uh, we don't welcome your feedback. So if you have any issues that you would like us to discuss, feel free to reach out to myself, Laura, or 
any member of the committee, and we would be happy to talk with you about that. So the private sector committee is your group to bring forward any uh, challenges you have in the private sector, or it could be opportunities as well. So always keep that in mind. Uh, also, also a special thanks to Laura for organizing today. Great job and uh, kept things going while I had uh, some trouble getting connected. And Ray, a comment? I'm just, is this being a, sort of a new aspect of CMOS that's being formed? Or is it just... Uh, the, the private sector committee has been around for quite a while. I don't know exactly how long, but um, I recently took over as chair and kind of restarted it because things went dormant for a while during COVID. That's a good initiative. Yeah, we're excited about it. And um, we've been, I think we kind of restarted last summer and held two webinars since, and we're continuing to talk about issues. So at our next meeting next week, we'll be kind of planning what uh, we'll be doing for the remainder of the year. Uh, Scott, will, uh, yeah, go ahead. will this committee have a presence at the upcoming Congress in St. John's? We won't really have a formal presence there. I'm sure some of our members will be attending, I'm sure, but we don't have anything planned at the moment. Okay, thanks. So with that, uh, I'll uh, conclude my remarks and hand it over to Laura if you have any final comments. All right. Thanks so much, Scott. And thank you to all of our presenters. And thank you for everyone joining for your questions. That was uh, really great and really interactive. So it's uh, everything we wanted. So thanks so much. And if you have any questions for anyone, um, emails and contact information are on the screen. Um, other than that, have yourselves a lovely day and hope to see some of you at CMOS in a little over a month. Perfect. Bye, everyone. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. <laughs>